Hello and welcome. Uh, I'm super honored to be here today um, having an interview with two amazing researchers, Basim Hans and Abdelaziz Al Bashiyan. Today we will be talking about one of our recent publications at the Conrad Adenauer Foundation um, on the normalization that is happening within the GCC countries. And uh, Sebastian and Abdelaziz will join us uh, to discuss um, some questions uh, encompassing the, um, the developments that are happening along the region and what they imply for the future uh, of um, the, the Gulf states or the um, Arab regions in general. I'll give the floor to our two researchers to introduce us, themselves briefly, and then we will delve into some of the aspects of the report and uh, some of the conclusions they have made. I'll start with Sebastian. Hi, Sebastian. Hi, Serene. Uh, very good to be with you. Um, yeah, briefly introduce myself. Um, my name is Sebastian. I'm working as a senior researcher for a think tank called Carpo, which is based in Germany. Um, I'm focusing for the last 15 years on the GCC countries, um, their development uh, cooperation policies, humanitarian aid policies, uh, regional and foreign policy, but also social economic transformation they are going through. Um, I did my PhD on labor migration from Pakistan to Saudi Arabia. And uh, I was very privileged to, to have the honor uh, working together with Aziz and, and our other colleague Tobias um, in order to conduct the study. And yeah, again, thank you for having me. Looking forward to our conversation. Thank you so much, Sebastian. I move to Abdelaziz. Yes. So thank you very much for having me, Serene. Uh, so my name is Abdelaziz Al Shayan. I'm a Saudi researcher uh, who focuses on Saudi foreign policy and in particular Saudi foreign policy towards Israel. So uh, I've been researching this and uh, I'm a PhD from the University of Essex where I lectured for about two years. And now I'm a, a, an independent researcher here in Saudi, focusing more on Saudi foreign policy. So yeah, it was a great pleasure to join Tobias and, and Sebastian on this work. Uh, I really do believe this uh, normalization with Syria really brings up a lot more questions than it does answers. So I'm very happy to go through that with you. Thank you so much, uh, Abdelaziz. So um, I'll address uh, this first question to Sebastian. Um, and I, I hope that we kind of give a bit of um, historic context to this conversation. Um, so Sebastian, in what way has the onset of the Arab Spring changed the Gulf states' relations to Syria and the Assad regime? I mean, in, in general, uh, we need to take into consideration that the Arab uprisings um, also provided kind of a momentum and a chance and an opportunity for, for the Gulf states to, to gain more leverage in the region um, mm -hmm. and to, uh, to have more impact on regional affairs. So um, when the Arab uprising started, and of course there was uh, tremendous turmoil um, in traditional power centers of the region, such as in Tunisia, Egypt, but of course also Syria, that was kind of a Gulf moment um, uh, for, for countries such as Saudi Arabia, Qatar and the UAE in particular. And, and afterwards, uh, they, they took the chance to, to fill in this, this power vacuum that was, uh, yeah, that, that emerged um, uh, during the, the Arab uprisings. Um, and, and therefore, uh, we saw um, a, a more proactive kind of an assertive um, strategy of the Gulf monarchies to um, yeah to play a more pivotal role in the region in different levels on a political level on an economic level on a, so a social level and in this regard also Syria became an important aspect uh, in this kind of of new power play um, so 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 when the when the civil war in Syria started um, uh, for the Gulf states it was on the one hand a challenge and on the one hand also an opportunity um, so it was a challenge because. Um, similar to, to Egypt and Tunisia, there was a civil uprising uh, that uh, was seeking to, um, to, get more, to get more civic rights, uh, to get more freedom, to get more political rights. Um, aspects that were of concern for, for the Gulf states because they aimed to preserve their political model uh, as monarchies. Uh, and in this regard, it was considered as a threat and as a challenge uh, because there was the impression or at least the concern that, that, that there might be a spillover effect from, from countries in turmoil such as Syria um, on, on the Gulf monarchies themselves and on their political leaderships. So therefore, 
specifically the UAE and Saudi Arabia established as kind of counter-revolutionary uh, forces in, in this regard um, and try to yeah, counterbalance uh, those, uh, those civic movements in those countries. On the other hand, as I outlined uh, in the beginning, it was also considered as a chance because um, due to the fact that there was a decline in traditional power players, there was also a rise in, 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 um, uh, in influence uh, on, the, on the Gulf states. And that was that was used, that was instrumentalized uh, by them in order to gain more more relevance. And here, and this is my final comment on that, um, we also saw more inter-Gulf rivalries, um, specifically between Saudi Arabia and the UAE on the one hand, who established themselves as counter-revolutionary and, and as status quo powers. And on the other hand, Qatar, um, who was more interested to promote and support um, um, yeah, specific, specifically Islam, Islamist movements in Tunisia, Egypt, but also uh, to some extent in Syria. And therefore, Syria became kind of a, also kind of a theater for this uh, internal Gulf rivalry in the in the next couple of, of years. Um, uh, and and therefore, it was not only about Syria itself; it was also about uh, the regional, um, the fundamental regional uh, changes uh, that we saw in the last ten years, starting with the Arab uprisings. Thank you so much, Sebastian, for your input. Here I have to ask Abdelaziz if also how he views this and if there is anything else you'd like to add. Yeah, I, I do. I, I agree, of course, with uh, Sebastian. And just uh, there's not much really to add to, to Sebastian, but I think uh, just a few points. I think one of the things that um, what the a Arab Spring has uh, kind of ushered in or jolted in was was a disruption of regional order that the, the actual order of the Middle East at the time was then ruptured. And then in this rupturing of this order, then you start to see exactly what Sebastian was talking about. You start to see all these players start to uh, be a bit more proactive, uh, start being, uh, I think, uh, thinking more into the future and really being more opportunistic. At the same time, also being, you know, uh, defensive. So we, we see a very interesting uh, zero sum uh, logic taking place here that uh, here was a very much an opportunity that was going to lend itself to them uh, furthering their own um, standing in the region. And I think what's very fascinating is that also to speak about what uh, or expand upon what uh, Sebastian was saying was was regarding the um, the inter GCC rivalry. Uh, you know, there was indeed a, a spill spillover effect, uh, but there was also, I think, what the yeah. uh, what the um, the the war happened, and particularly the Syrian civil war, is that it created a spilling in effect. That you know, there that these rivalries that were taking place were 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 amplified even further, uh, and I think you know from that from a rivalry. Uh, that for example, a, a Gulf or Arab Gulf uh, rivalry with Iran was certainly amplified. But then, even as as Sebastian said, you know, an inter uh, GCC rivalry was also even further amplified, which led to more problems and in, in crises within the GCC itself later on or soon after. And actually, not even soon after, but during the actual war itself. Um, so the, the, the Arab Spring really was a transformational moment. Um, and it, it also, I think, illustrated the limitations of a lot of these countries that, you know, I think they've, they've been too, their, their strategy has been too dependent on external factors. They've been very reactive to what the United States will do. And I think, you know, given the uh, the international dynamic um, and the hesitancy of the United States, especially under Obama, uh, you know, these states had to be a bit more proactive, which is something that they weren't really comfortable with. And not only not comfortable with, I, I just think they're not even capable of being strategically proactive in the region, uh, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, trying to overthrow or detrench uh, someone like Assad. So it was a it, it was a, a very significant moment um, that shed a lot of that amplified a lot of uh, relations uh, tensions, 
and also illustrated limitations of states. Thank you, Abdelaziz. Um, so here I, I have to look at um, Syria being in isolation for 12 years. And after 12 years, in May 2023, Syria was readmitted into the Arab League. Can you please talk a bit more about regional and maybe the international dynamics that have led to those uh, developments? Sebastian, over to you, sir. Okay, uh, but please uh, add to everything I've, yeah. I, I will miss. Um, I think the, the magic word here is multipolar world order. Uh, I think this is exactly um, what is currently of utmost importance for the Gulf monarchies. Um, and uh, jumping on what, what Aziz said before, um, to deal with a more proactive or uh, with a more proactive um, power relationship in the region is maybe the main challenge uh, that the Gulf states need to need to face. And, and in particular, the assumption that the US is withdrawing from the region, whatever that means, um, that is, of course, also uh, one aspect that all Gulf states need to take more closer into consideration than 10 years ago. So um, yes, they they have felt very uncomfortable uh, with this with the situation that they need to act on their own or they should mo act more on their own, but no, they are trying to adapting to this situation. And the reintegration of Syria into the Arab League is is one one of those examples. So although uh, there is still a lot of mistrust in the Assad regime, although. Um, there is still um, a, a huge skepticism on most of the Gulf states, how to deal with Assad and, and uh, what to do with the Assad re regime in the future. Um, there is a very pragmatic understanding um, that Assad is there and will stay there um, uh, if, if they like it or not. And I think um, this calculation has led to the decision within the Arab League that most of the GCC countries um, are or have been supportive of this reintegration just for pragmatic re reasons. And I think um, the main objectives behind behind this de decision are twofold. The first is, yes, we need to take um, the regional uh, architecture in our own hands. We need to design it on our own because nobody else will do it. Uh, the US um, is not capable anymore. It's more focusing on its competition with China. Uh, we have um, we have a paralyzed Europe, uh, which is not engaging um, very much in the region and is uh, completely overwhelmed with the uh, Russian war on Ukraine. Um, and uh, the second main reason is um, if the Gulf states want to be successful in diversifying their economies and, and being uh, successful in their respective business models, then they need regional stability. And uh, here we see the Syria integration as one big example, but others uh, are, also, uh, are also very prominent. Um, the, the lift of the blockade against Qatar in 2021 is one example for this reconciliation trend in the region. And of course, also the uh, rapprochement, the resumption of diplomatic ties between Saudi Arabia and Iran in spring this year is another example uh, that regional players are more interested into de-escalation rather than in def defamation and polarization. And I think this is um, not because they like each other so much. This is because um, they want to promote their, their own business um, environments and they want to preserve uh, themselves as very attractive uh, business hubs. And this is particularly true for Saudi Arabia. So I think we need to understand um, uh, the, the Syrian integration into the Arab League as part of this of this broader understanding in the region that it's much more important to preserve regional stability than to foster regional conflicts. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, so, Aziz, as a Saudi, I'm also keen to see your input on this, like from the perspective of someone who lives in the Gulf. Like, yeah. how do, or like, how do you see this? How do people in Saudi Arabia? How do they see this? Well. Uh... They well, they see this as a part of a uh, process of de-escalation, and this uh, idea of de-escalation is very fascinating because I think when it comes to uh, the region, and just to uh, expand really upon what um, uh, Sebastian rightly said, is that 
I think there is a, the the de-escalation is viewed not for the sake of just de-escalation, but really for the sake of a great deal of a lot of the uh, the economic projects that are taking place in the region. You know, it's it, it during this time before the the normalization and during really the Arab uh, Spring, there was uh, you know for Saudi Arabia, I think it went through a great deal of fundamental change. There was a new leadership. Uh, there was a generational leadership, even though the king is still King Salman, but uh, nevertheless, you know, Mohammed bin Salman very much uh, 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 was elevated into the upper echelons of, of uh, Saudi elites, political elites. And he brought with him uh, a, a, just a fundamentally different vision than what Saudi Arabia uh, was operating in. Uh, and that was this regional project and Envision 2030. And I think for many Saudis, and in particularly the ruling elite, they realize that, okay, Vision 2030 cannot operate, cannot happen, uh, and we cannot achieve our uh, objectives and these very lofty economic ambitions without a stable region. As a result, you start to see... Uh, almost a securitization of this economy, uh, of the economic uh, ambitions, that basically, it, it, you know, it, this normalization was viewed as a new turning point of trying to, rather than confront people and confront actors, uh, it's actually to incentivize actors into uh, performing and contributing towards a, a region that will be prosperous. And I think, you know, it's just, it's also worth, you know, mentioning along the, some King Abdullah of Jordan mentioned it, right? You know, he, he succinct, succinctly put it, uh, if if one person, we, we've realized, and in particularly against the backdrop of the uh, Ukraine war, uh, the war on Ukraine, uh, the Russian war, war on Ukraine last year, is that, we realized that if one of us is not in good shape, that means all of us have the potential of not being in good shape. So I think the the integration of the of the region in itself uh, speaks to the desire that there has to be a regional agency. There has to be an aspect of trying to, you know, as Sebastian said, build this infrastructure and to build the architecture of the region and maybe rebuild it uh, again from an economic sense. It's very interesting how the region in itself was not that integrated, and that was one of the reasons why you know it was very, uh, it, it didn't gel very much. You know, there's a lot of these peace deals, and it never really, it never really worked. And and I think what one of the things they're changing now is you know the, this this economic logic that I think Saudi and others in the GCC are using. So um, you know it. it it is indeed part of this multipolarization of the world order uh, that is taking place that's really, uh, I would say, uh, nudging the region into working more collaboratively. And as a result, this is one of the factors that pushed for this normalization with Syria. Thank you, Abdelaziz. And I, I see like the push or the need of um, like, the region to be more um, working together in a solid way. But I mean, I have to emphasize that there is a fact that I have to say that there is a fact that the GCC states are not at the moment at like acting as a unified bloc. Mm -hmm. And here I want maybe to ask um, Sebastian. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the perspective or the country-specific interests when it comes to re-establishing these ties with Syria? Yeah, I think, Sirene, what you, what, you, what you say is right. Um, there is no, the GCC is not a monolithic bloc. It, it never was. Um, so the GCC as an institution is, is um, still quite dysfunctional. Um, there are internal um uh, internal tensions still going on we have seen uh the gulf crisis between 12 tw uh, 2017 2021 um so of course every gulf state is 
um, looking for its own interests. And what we see at the moment is um, hyper-nationalism in, in, in most of the GCC countries um, and uh, a Saudi or UAE or Qatari first approach uh, that that defines the region as um, as a as a field for um, for power projection and as a field for national economic diversification. So for me, at least, yes, there is a trend towards more dialogue. Um, I'm a little bit more skeptical if there is a real trend towards regional integration, uh, because currently we see more um, a, a trend towards conflict management rather than conflict uh, solution. So the uh, coming back to Syria, the, the reintegration of Syria into the Arab League is, is for me, um, part of this conflict management trend, but the underlying root causes of the conflict um, are not really touched by, uh, by the GCC engagement in, in Syria. We see a similar trend, for instance, in Yemen uh, and, and other countries as well. So um, in order to preserve economic and business interests and to keep the respective business models attractive for foreign investors and, and for the world economy, um, there needs to be at least um, the the mitigation of uh, of conflicts, and there need to be at least yeah conflict management. Um, and this uh, also plays out when it comes to the uh, particular interests of of GCC states and their engagement in Syria. I think um, and 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 um, maybe Aziz, you can tell more a little bit about the Saudi perspective. Uh, so let me quickly focus on. Uh, on, on the UAE, for instance, uh, the UAE have taken a very pragmatic business oriented approach towards Syria in the last couple of years, even before the, the reintegration into the Arab League. Um, so it was driven by pragmatism. We have seen in 2018, um, already in 2018, the reopening of the embassy. There were joint high ranking visits. Um, uh, Assad went uh, to the UAE. Um, uh, Mohammed bin Zayed uh, went to Syria. Uh, Bashar al-Assad is invited to, to join the, the climate conference that will take place in November and December in Dubai. Uh, so here we see um, a, a high grade of pragmatism, I would argue, for economic reasons. Uh, so Syria is per se an attractive market for the UAE. Um, the UAE is a champion when it comes to um, uh, partnership and economic diversification. Um, and here, uh, the UAE sees some potential when it comes to infrastructure, energy projects, things like that, at least on paper. Um, uh, so there's also, and when we take, for instance, Oman into consideration, Oman was also quite supportive in this kind, in this reintegration uh, of Syria into the Arab League, but for different reasons. Oman, as we all know, is, is traditionally, historically, um, a country uh, that that aims to promote mediation and regional integration and dialogue. Uh, it needs to look for um, for mutual solutions because it has not the the financial capacities, not the political leverage. Uh, in contrast to Saudi Arabia, UAE, or Qatar, for instance, um, uh, yeah, to to control and really to to balance uh, power relations in the region in its sense. So therefore, partnership models are always more interesting for, for Oman, and therefore it has, uh, it has been in favor of, of the reintegration uh, of Syria into the Arab League, even before the decision that was taken a couple of months ago. And then finally, we have Qatar, uh, which is taking, yeah, let's say, opposing position uh, to this reintegration. Yes, it has not, um, it has not uh, opposed the decision itself, um, uh, but uh, when we when we hear uh, when we listen to to uh, Qatari officials, there is still a, a huge skepticism when it comes to this reintegration because um, it is lacking conditionality on the on the Syrian side. So um, are there real conditions that the Syrian regime needs to uh, needs needs to accept um, needs to realize in the future? And here uh, the Qatari leadership is is uh, more skeptical. Uh, more reserved, more hesitant than, for instance, Oman and the UAE. I will leave it at that. Uh, but, but Aziz, um, over to you. Also, when it comes to to Saudi Arabia, which is also taking a very special position on Syria. Yes. So I think, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Syrian, I could uh, continue. Uh, j just to expand, really, on on Sebastian's point uh, is that when it, I, I just before we go to to Saudi, I I I think the 
the uh, the role of Qatar is very fascinating because I think you know as uh, Sebastian said, it, it, Syria means different things for the for different states within the GCC, and I think if one was to look at, for example, Qatari foreign policy, Qatari foreign policy ha has been very um, dynamic, and and it, it, since ever since uh, Hamad, uh, Sheikh Hamad. Since ever since 1995 and 1996, uh, but even in this dynam dynamism, they had that principle of firstly using regional uh, issues to illuminate its own identity and to get away from this uh, emancipate itself from this uh, Saudi dominated GCC. So you know, for example. Um, it was one of the first countries that, for example, had uh, uh, re business relations with with Israel very early on. And now you see, for example, the complete opposite position. So it's always in a quest to highlight that, hey, Qatar is here and we are autonomous somehow. And I think one of the ways, one of the reasons why they didn't jump onto this bandwagon is because now it's there is a foreign policy the you know the 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 Qatari foreign policy also is based on really on perceptions of the Arab streets that uh, it's saying that you know this is not uh, a very popular um, decision. Uh, Assad is still viewed as a mass murderer, uh, and also with Al Jazeera, which is the most proactive uh, outlet that has demonized uh, Assad, especially with very Colorful characters like Faisal Al Ghassim, who uh, we've watched in Tijah Al Maakis, the the opposite direction, which is more of a comical show than it, it is a a, a a a serious show. Um, but you know, it illustrates the fact that okay, th their policy is really based on the streets. And here, just to expand also on on Sebastian's point, the fact of not supporting the admission or not normalizing relations with Syria is an illustration of its, if it's uh, sticking to its principles. Um, and the same can be said on the other side with Saudi, the other side, you know, again, this Saudi Qatari divergence hasn't changed really, even in the process of normalization, it's still really the same. But I think when it comes to the Saudi aspect, the Saudi aspect is very fascinating because I can't help but think that Saudi is really eager, maybe a little bit too quickly to de-escalate things and just to say, let's just calm down. Let's just you know stop uh, this de-escalation and let's just quickly turn a new page. In other words, one can say there is a very optimistic view uh, that Saudi is motivated by. Uh, trying to normalize relations, but also, you know, there there are other factors that Saudi normalize relations for more security reasons, and there's two main security reasons, and in, in, in for Saudi, I think. Firstly, I think anybody that is um, following Saudi, especially in Arabic, they will see a, a massive anti-drug campaign that is taking place here in Saudi. I mean. I never knew this amount of drugs were happening here. You know, uh, no wonder why people were in their houses, probably. But um, they, you know, they were, they, there was, they, you know, there's just a lot of smuggling of captagon and issues and where Syria was no longer a transfer state. It became a, a state of um, uh, building this kind of uh, drug uh, industry and this drug empire and they had to use it to keep it afloat i think anybody I, we wrote that in the inter in the in the report is that this was used uh as as means to keep the assad regime afloat so they had to deal work and security wise with this there's also another interesting aspect and i think for saudi arabia it it needs to have a partner in syria to stop having another failed state and in other words to stop having a potential uh reducing a vacuum where it can be used as a, a terrorist haven 
uh, or, or, a, found, or a, a foundation. Now, why is this important? Because I think it particularly for Saudi Arabia, Saudi is undergoing a lot of social dynamics and social change. And I think a lot of things that could be, you know, a shock to the Saudi system in many ways. Um, you know, there's a, this social liberalization that's taking place, this opening up, this, this becoming very globalized uh, Saudi Arabia, where everyone is uh, coming from abroad and, and you see these you know, yeah, videos and clips of people dancing and intermixing and, and they're saying Saudi wasn't like this a few years. You know, it, it was a lot for them to take in. And I think Saudi are very worried that how can this be channeled into or used or misused and instrumentalized by terrorist groups. Um, and, and so the fact that once there is a regional security, there's more regional security, the less likely uh, there is a, a, a platform for people to be emboldened um, to do uh, terrorist activities. Uh, so for Saudi, it's also a matter of security. And I think that just the last point on this, the third and, and, and last point on briefly, you know, again, I think the point that Sebastian mentioned is very, very uh, on point uh, because it was a matter of, um, you know, projection. I think in this, what, what's very fascinating is that I think from the Jidda summit of 2022, the, the, the one in July, where the, the famous fist bump uh, between South MBS and and uh, Biden, and the fact that MBS didn't receive him from the airport, and he let someone else escort him back on the plane, this made him very popular in the Arab streets, not in Saudi, very popular in the Arab streets. And I think he sensed that his role and his perception, and and I would say uh, his, I I. I projection um, of, of not yielding to American pressure made him somewhat of a, a, a tacit Arab leader. So there is a, 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 a tacit bid in leadership here in trying to reestablish and reorder the Arab world again. But I think uh, the rhetoric wasn't very successful. Because I think it was, you know, I, I don't think it um, it uh, got the the, the uh, intended response from Syria. I'll stop there. Maybe we could talk about this afterwards. But uh, we could talk, you know, I'll, I'll stop there and we could talk afterwards. Do you feel like in any sense there would be some sort of development in like collaboration in terms of economics or humanitarian aid or any of that sort in the foreseeable future and that question goes out to both of you like whoever feels like they want to go first yeah i i could go first this time if if, if you want to uh I, yes and i think the fact that but i we will see it in more of uh, in my opinion i wonder if uh, sebastian agrees but I, I anticipate it will be uh more of an ad hoc kind kind of uh cooperation rather than a sustained long kind of institutionalized process and that was the part of the whole normalization is that you know it's creating the infrastructure and it's already kind of um, removing the obstacles for when they have to cooperate with these things and and by the time that there is that decision to cooperate uh the the situation isn't that uh, controversial they don't need in other words to invest a great deal of political capital uh, to legitimize this relationship and re legitimize this ad hoc cooperation uh, as short as short as it can be. So this was the the whole intention, in my opinion, for the Saudi logic is that listen, let's get the, let's remove this as a headache, and let's just get you know start again and uh, have a new page. It doesn't mean we're friends. It doesn't mean we like we we like what they did, and it doesn't mean we have to forget about this history that that only a few years ago just happened. But it means that if we need to cooperate with each other, we can. 
Yeah, I, I definitely agree with what you said, Aziz. Um, I think the main purpose is transactional uh, to, to look what is working and what is not working. And um, uh, it, was an, it was provided as an incentive to the Assad regime. Okay, we, um, take a, we, we um, give you the chance to be part of the Arab family again. Although um, although you you committed war crimes, you are still a mass murder, you are a criminal, um, uh, but we want to come over it and we want to um, start from the scratch to some extent. But at least there needs to be some uh, reaction on, on the Assad side. And, and, and so far, uh, I think um, he has not delivered. Maybe there was never an intention from him to deliver, specifically on the drug trafficking side, which is, as, as, uh, as Aziz pointed out uh, uh, correctly, um, that is a very huge obstacle for, for Saudi Arabia. And here, at least, um, there is a, a huge pressure also on the Saudi government to achieve results. And, and so far, um, as far as I see it, um, there are no huge results on this front. So therefore, I can imagine that also the rhetoric um, towards Assad could become a little bit more tense in the future in order to uh, to underline, okay, uh, we, um, we did not give you a, a carte blanche to continue as before, um, but we also want to see uh, some commitment on your end um and and therefore um the the perspectives for concrete economic political security cooperation are still very limited um uh, definitely the um the disastrous uh, um, earthquake in in syria and turkey this spring provided also a window of opportunity to uh promote this kind of of reintegration into the arab league and and was also an opportunity for the Gulf states to show a humanitarian, or as it was as it was called, earthquake diplomacy by providing humanitarian aid. Um, it was all, but it's also very fascin fascinating to look who delivered which kind of aid to which areas in Syria. So of course there was um, uh, the Qatari aid was never delivered to to areas controlled by the regime. Uh, UAE, UAE, Bahrain, if I'm not mistaken, did it. Saudi Arabia did it to both areas, so that also indicates a little bit how this, how the 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 fragmentation of uh, inside the Gulf towards the Assad re regime was and still is. And I think when it comes to humanitarian aid, yes, um, uh, there are perspectives to to more cooperation, specifically when we think about uh, the the very serious uh, situation of Syrian refugees um, located in in Lebanon, Jordan, uh, Turkey. So what will happen with them? Uh, do they need to return? Do they receive, if they need to return, do they receive humanitarian aid from the Gulf inside Syria? Um, uh, is, uh, is the tremendous um, uh, provision of aid that was going to those countries going down because the Syrian refugees need to return back home? So here, I think in this humanitarian dimension, uh, there is maybe the, the the most potential to see concrete action in the future. But when it comes to economic engagement, when it comes to, I don't know, uh, in, investments in energy uh, infrastructure um, and, and other infrastructure, here, of course, uh, the U.S. Uh, Caesars Act, um, the, 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 the sanctions regime that is still in place um, uh, on Syria and that also sanctions uh, every um, investment and economic engagement with Syria, is a, is a burden for every for every GCC country and is of course also a very limiting factor uh, to engage more uh, with Syria. So yes, um, there is a trend to to let's say um, uh, to, to have more em emancipation from the U.S. in the region, but still, uh, I mean, uh, the U.S. is a very important partner uh, in economic and security terms. And nobody in the region would risk this kind of relationship by investing a couple of millions into Syria, not not at the moment. Uh, so therefore, here again, I think pragmatism is is what counts. And and if Saudi Arabia is, for instance, considering uh, the relationship with Syria as a bot as a bottomless pit, um, and and as um, as something that is not going into the right direction, it will not not risk other other relations uh, for for more economic engagement in Syria. That at least that is at least my my assumption at the moment.
Uh, thank you so much. Um, here I like this is my last um, question here, and I would like to reflect on the past um, events that have unfolded in the region um, with the like attack that Hamas launched on October 7th on Israel and how that unfolded on Gaza. Do you feel that would impact um, the Syrian Gulf relations in any way, especially that we have seen Israel bomb the Aleppo and the Damascus airport and there have been some back and forth going on the borders with Lebanon, uh, on the Gulan. So what is your... Um, what is your like intake of that, and how would you reflect on that for the future? I hope you don't mind, Sebastian, if I go first. Uh, I I think, in, in my opinion, this is a very interesting point because I think we we touched upon it a little bit in the in the report regarding what does this mean for Gulf uh, or GCC Israeli relations, um, and I think while uh initially i thought you know wow this is actually very interesting that okay now the arab peace initiative uh it calls for the golan heights uh, again uh and to be honest i don't think it 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 changed much of the the the, the trajectory that the gcc states had some of the gc states had with the um, with israel but i think now in this Arab-Israeli war, the Palestinian issue has now become a space that uh, I think they could, Arab state, GCC states and Syria can agree on. Because it's not just GCC states and Syria, it's also GCC states and Iran. I mean, right now we're looking at a, a, a unified region in its stance on this issue and that when Saudis and others have, have criticized Israeli action, they also criticize Israeli action regionally, not, not just on the Palestinians. Because I think what have they, they've been saying is that the, you know, the issue is that this occupation has been uh, problematic and will be problematic regionally. And I think in that kind of uh, uh, rhetoric and logic, they they are looking at Syria as a potential sphere where Arab Israeli relations and conflict and war can spill over. And not even Arab Israeli relations, but even uh, Israeli Iranian relations can spill over into the Syrian sphere. And so therefore there cannot be, you know, th there needs to be governance there and kind of in and, and boost Assad agency here to at least not kind of uh, provide uh, more of a, a, a platform where Iranian uh, sponsored groups and others can just perform as they want uh, and, and allow Syria to even exasperate tensions even more or to be a platform where they could exasperate tensions. So the more there is governance, the less likely uh, there will be um, spillover of uh, Arab-Israeli conflict. And this is, I think, the whole logic behind and the philosophy behind uh, trying to normalize relations with Israel. I'm sorry, normalize relations with Assad. That That's how I think, you know, it's it, 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 right now the GCC states are are actually very uh, trying to contain this conflict in 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 Israel and Palestine a lot of the great deal of it they don't want it to spill over however in my opinion i think if if it does spill over the gcc states at least have a layer of protection uh from iran which is this normalization of relations with iran Better relations around by hinting that it that it's it's not uh, part of one side. So I think it's it's just very interesting how this is going to uh, play out. And uh, just to 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 go back to the point, I I think 
when it comes to normalization of Syria, it's yet another illustration of why there needs to having governance of sorts uh, in Syria helps reduce uh, spillovers. I don't have much to add on this, uh, Aziz. Uh, very, very interesting uh, what you have said. Uh, I think containment is, is uh, again, is is the main the main motivation of all GCC states, um, because if this conflict will escalate even further and will will become a regional conflict, then again, um, coming back to to our uh, to to our discussion, um, then again, of course, also the the aspirations. Of the Gulf states, particular in Saudi Arabia, to preserve economic and political stability are on the brink, and and um, that is that is the the driving force um, we see in in the in the reconciliation with Syria, with Iran, and I think uh, also when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian war, um, containment is is of utmost priority at the moment. De-escalation is of utmost priority. But maybe let me add one uh, one critical point, uh, which we also take into consideration, because it's not only about Israel; um, it's also about the West in in, in general. So, um, uh, at least also from an from a European perspective, um, I'm 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 quite concerned about the fact that this um, polarization, which which is particular escalating um, uh, uh, during during the conflict we see at the moment. Between between the Arab world uh, and the West or or Europe or particular countries in Europe, uh, that also is is um, is concerning from a, from a political and um, and from a partnership point of view. So um, if we want to to work together more closely in the future, um, uh, this polarization we see at the moment is um, is difficult. And um, and and I think at least from my perspective, also talking with, with, with colleagues in the region and also to follow the debate in Europe, um, uh, the, the, there is um, there is a trend towards more anti-Western sentiments in the region. And there is also a trend inside Europe uh, to have more polarization when it comes to, to the region itself. And I think th this is um, this is opposing the interest to uh, to promote regional integration, uh, to promote also more people-to-people -people dialogue, uh, to promote better understanding, um, not only within the region, but also uh, between Europe and the region. Um, and, and therefore, I'm, I'm personally uh, quite concerned about this development at the moment. Uh, I, um, uh, and and um, I think this is also one aspect we, we should take into consideration, which is not directly related to Syria. Uh, but which is related to um, to again to a multipolar world order and to um, uh, to a rise in, in in polarization and 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 defamation um, uh, on all levels and and we see it currently unfortunately in a very intense way. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, Amblazi. Um I feel like this report has come at the right time. And uh, it's interesting to see. I think we have to do a part two now <laughs> because I think there's going to be a lot of development happening in the coming couple of months, like four to six months. So uh, maybe uh, let's see how everything unfolds and maybe we can recap uh, shortly, uh, maybe two months after this and uh, look at how things have changed, how some things have remained um, the same and how we can foresee maybe a different future. Um, thank you again. Um, we highly appreciate your contribution and we look forward to collaborating with you at TAS in the future. Fantastic. It's really our pleasure to be and thank you very much for, for, for hosting us and for giving us the opportunity really to share the research. I know, uh, to be honest, I just want to also say, I mean, thanks to Sabah, uh, to, to Tobias, who was excellent. I wish he was here to add a lot of the great uh, insights that he had. He's a, he's a great economist i would say in in, in his business uh, ideas and 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 other things are, are are very good and but i also personally want to just thank uh, you all and i also want to thank sebastian because he was the one that was the lead of the, of this project and um, he's he's um, it's just a real honor for me to really work with him he's a great guy and uh, i'm i'm just very happy to build this relationship with everyone here
Thank you, Aziz. Uh, likewise, um, it was really my pleasure working with you and, and of course, with Tobias. Um, I'm looking forward to meet you very soon on your on your ranch. Uh, so in, in Riyadh, um, and, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Serene, for, for having us and, and for giving us the opportunity. Um, and yeah, ho hopefully we can collaborate in the future again. Thank you so much. And I hope I can see you soon in person. Inshallah. Inshallah. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much.